Welcome to Critical Issues Commentary, the podcast ministry of Gospel of Grace Fellowship, a non-denominational Christian church in St. Louis Park, Minnesota. This is Jessica Kramus, your host for this series. I'm speaking today with Bob DeWay, Gospel of Grace's teacher and theologian and author of Critical Issues Commentary. Now, in the past five sessions, we've been discussing the latest CIC article, Issue 138, Enneagram, Pagan Mysticism Promoted as Christian Growth. You can find that on our website, so you can follow along, cicministry.org, or if you prefer the Kindle version, that's available on Amazon. We've covered panentheism. We've covered the occult sources of the Enneagram. We've covered the faulty definitions of sin, faulty definitions of self. So today, let's pick up with how Enneagram theology diminishes the reality of the fall. Yes, we covered some of that, but we're still working on it. Right. Okay, so what this theology does is really creates an unbiblical worldview. Okay. And this unbiblical worldview is going to turn everything on its head as far as what the Bible teaches about man, God, and redemption, and so on, as we've been saying. And so let me quote something that I said here in this article. This theology diminishes both the reality of the fall and the true transcendence of the Trinitarian God of the Bible, whose eternal self-existence is not contingent on anything, and who in his perfection eternally existed before he created the universe. So the biblical worldview, as we say many times, is linear. Okay. And it begins with creation. Right. Okay. So that's our view of history, from creation to judgment. Okay. Now, they don't believe that. God is somehow tied up in part of this whole process. Okay. So they believe that God's in everything, and he doesn't have those essential attributes I just talked about. Okay. Now, John 1, 1 through 18, claims that Christ, the eternal Lagos, created everything and came into the world. It's very important, listeners, that you know John 1, 1 through 18. Okay. And learn a theology taught in that prologue of the Gospel of John. But Richard Rohr has a different idea about Christ. He has a picture in his book of the Enneagram, which is a circle with the nine equidistant points, three triangles. But in his book, he has a picture that's associated with Christ. If people, I don't know why in their mind they think that's Christ, but that's who it represents. Okay. So there's a person in the middle of his circle This Christ. Okay. So Christ is the perfect exemplar of all nine of the character qualities or types of persons. According to Rohr, Christ represents God and hence, says Rohr, the essence of the world in its true being. Oh, wow. So Christ represents the world in its true being. Then they have a picture of Christ with those nine numbers. Wow. This is utterly pagan. It is. This is pagan. So if if God is in everything, and Christ represents the world as true being, what do we have to look forward to? How much more clear could it possibly be that this is a false Christ? I marked in the margin of my article, a false Christ. Wow. And I mentioned, I think, in a sermon, was it Sunday? I was talking about if somebody comes and preaches a different Jesus, yep, a different spirit or whatever. Right. You bear with that. Mm-hmm. Ironically, he's rebuking the Corinthians. They wouldn't listen to what Paul had to say about God and Christ. Right. But if somebody came with a false Christ. Yeah. Uh, you could apply that to this. Yeah. The only reason we're doing this, the only reason I wrote this article is because this stuff came into a local college that we know people that went to in the past yeah. when it was really a Christian college. Right. For now they call themselves a university. That's the only reason I'm doing this. And this is exactly what Paul was lamenting. You bear with this false Christ taught by Richard Rohr, 
but will anybody in your college teach and present the true Christ of the Bible, who is transcendent, who created, who's coming again in judgment? I got to know. I, it's, it's odd. Why will they listen to a pagan Christ but not the true Christ? Because they haven't heard the true gospel and been redeemed yeah. or believed it. The churches are watering down what they're preaching so people don't even know these issues. Right. Feel good Christianity. They want their kids to be Christians, so they send them to a Christian university. The churches are watered down. The university is even more pagan. Yep. And where is Christ in the gospel? Well, in case we haven't convinced our listeners yet, why don't you read this next quote from Rohr? Here's what Rohr says, all right? In the following passages, when we describe the, the Enneagram as the icon of the face of Christ, we interpret this as at once the face of God and the face of true man. Wow. Jesus realized true personhood in a manner that explodes the possibility of pinning him down to any one personality type. He, says Rory, is the perfect exemplar of a person who has heard the invitation of God and had the freedom to answer it. So he's the exemplar of the nine personality types. And the God of Rohr isn't transcendent. The Christ of Roar isn't going to come in judgment. Right. And the Christ of Roar is the exemplar of the true man who is the essence of the being of God. That's part of the universe. So this Christ is not part of the triune God. Not, He's not heard the biblically. invitation of God. Yeah. It's, he's like the first man to truly realize his own divinity, which is very common. I'm used to this when studying world religions. Right. And Buddhism and what have you, or Ken Wilber, which one of these guys promotes. I have a chapter in my book on emergent about Ken Wilber. Right. Who they admire, the Enneagram people. Mm -hmm. So we have this false Christ. Now Hertz, we were talking about Roar, and so he has a version of this. Okay. Hertz version sees a pristine self that got messed up and has to re be regained through self-awareness. So they have Christ being the first one to attain that true self-awareness. Okay. So that just really is the opposite of what we read in John 1. Yeah, go learn, John. I don't know where they're going to go to do this, but learn the Bible. Yeah. Learn how to read. Get a good commentary. Yep. John 1, 1 through 18. Right. Okay. What is being claimed in John 1? In the beginning was the Lagos. The Lagos was with God. The Lagos was God, the Word. Okay. He came into the world. It talks about the world being in its darkness. Yep. He is the light coming into the world, the world's dwelling in darkness. Just learn the Bible. Why waste your time studying this nonsense when you don't even know the Bible to start with? And how in the world are you not going to be deceived by this Enneagram if you don't know the Bible? Right. And if you do know the Bible, why are you even wanting the Enneagram? Yep. I don't it's get it. Okay, so listeners, if you want to learn the book of John, we have a class on the CIC website, CICministry.org. Go under Classes and click on the link that says John, and our ministry associate, Ryan Habanaugh, preached through and taught through the book of John, and all of the MP3s and PowerPoints are there. It's a great class and a great way to learn the true Word of God. Good. Okay, so I was talking about this true self. Okay. And then you need solitude, silence, and stillness to try to find that true self. So there's our three S's again. Yeah. Here's what this hurt says. But with contemplative practice as our companion and guide, we will find faith and courage to become who we were before the assault on our original righteousness or virtue occurred. 
Okay, so again, so we have sin from coming from the outside, not. Yeah, there's no sin nature. There's no fall. That's Hertz, page 193. Okay. So there was an assault on our original righteousness. Listeners, wow. the Bible teaches original sin. These false teachers teach original righteousness. Wow. Who are you going to believe? I would like to know if there's any students out there that want to be courageous and go to the people who are bringing us into their colleges or missionary organizations or churches and show them this. If you have Hertz's book, go to page 192, find this, and ask the pastor, do you believe in original righteousness or do you believe in original sin? Which is it? Wow, yep. And if you don't believe in original righteousness, why are you giving this stuff out? Right. Why is it recommended? Why yep. aren't you warning the flock against it? Right. It seems like the, the common response is, well, it's just a personality test. We're, we're not denying that people have different personalities and that we can kind of come up with a personality type for each person. That's not what this is. This is a spiritual practice. This is not yeah. just a personality test. Right. The personality test is only used to find out what mystical practice you need to use to get back to your original righteous self. Right. This is a doctrine. This isn't just a parlor game. And by the way, we're not denying people have different gifts or aptitudes or personalities. So be it. Yeah. Show up in church and serve God and love Christ, believe the gospel, you don't have to do self-discovery to be a good Christian. Right. We don't need to discover ourselves. We need to know God. Right. Self-discovery is confusing. Yeah. And so the personality theory that they've attached to it is very recent development anyhow. They all say that. Right. That when this stuff was proposed whenever, early 20th century, nobody was talking about personality types. Right. So, well, and if you research the history of Enneagram, the original Enneagram had no numbers and no personality types assigned to it. That was added much later. Yeah. Um, it, it, it wasn't a cult practice to start with. Right. It, it's, it's really sad. They're telling you what you believe. I don't know why there isn't more discernment. I know people don't know how to think critically, or if they're not studying. But it wasn't hard for me to find what was wrong with this. Right. Let me quote him on the next page. This hurts. Page 193. Quote, fundamentally, what we are doing here is excavating our essence, our true self, from the lies and programs and temptations we've wrapped around our identity. So the true self has to be excavated, like in mine for minerals, okay? And then he, Richard Rohr, goes to Carl Jung and his collective unconscious, which is occultic. Right. Uh, Rohr looks for some theory to discover the true self. It's not scientific. We've already established that because they say it's not. Right. And it is occult, and they say that it is. Wow. This isn't in the Bible. Right. I'm going to prove that. I started, I'm going to write an article. I started laying out the outline. Okay. They try to prove Jesus' temptations, teach solitude, silence, and stillness, which aren't even mentioned anywhere right. in the passage. I'll write about that. But this collective unconscious and interconnectedness of all things is Eastern religion. It's not the Bible. All right, let's explain that for people. I don't know what the collective unconscious is. Well, Jung had this theory that neuroses and mental problems and things that would come through dreams or self-hypnosis or external hypnosis, whatever brings this stuff out, Yeah. that there's this cosmic self that's all interconnected. Uh -huh. And some of this stuff was coming out from that cosmic self. Okay. And so he would be dealing with patients who could say things or come up with things that were from classical literature or some other 
thing that they, he knows this uneducated person had no access to. Okay. So that experience in his therapeutic process was part of how he came up with this cosmic self. But okay. he also had a spirit guide. Oh, no. Jung had a spirit guide. Okay. And this whole thing is occultic. But Rohr cites uh, Jung as a, as a good thing. When Rohr talks about the ground of being, what is the ground of being? Again, that is an Eastern idea you'll see in Buddhism, part of their whole pantheistic slash panentheistic worldview, rather than a transcendent God who existed from all eternity, who is not somehow contingent on anything in history. Okay. He's transcendent. He's providentially in charge of history, but he's not responsible for evil. He allows evil. But their ground of being is this divine essence that's in the whole or the all wow. that has to be excavated. Now, there's different versions of it. When I did my research for my book on emergent, okay. I interviewed people. I read their books. I went to a conference. I did all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. They believe in the same panentheistic worldview, and they say so. Right. All right? That gives them hope that everything's evolving into some better future. Okay. And we've identified Hegel as the source of that philosophy. And so this ground of being is something to be discovered. And some of the authors I read even said, we are the universe thinking about itself. Oh, good grief. Okay. So you're trying to get in, in touch with this other that's found in your own inner being. Okay. And it's only accessed through this process of meditation or centering prayer or silencing the mind. Okay. Now, let me talk about this excavating the divine being within. Okay. Evidently, Christians don't hear the kind of doctrines that I was taught when I was a brand new Christian. Okay. And I went from Iowa State University where I was a junior in chemical engineering mm -hmm. to a Bible college. One of the first doctrines they taught to me as a new Christian was that the old self died. Right. I just told a story about that recently in one of my sermons. Mm -hmm. The old self is dead. In Christian baptism, you're symbolically burying the old man right? or showing that you believe that he's dead and symbolically being raised to newness of life in Christ. Right. This happened through the work of Christ. Mm -hmm. And when we believe the gospel and repent and turn to Christ, the old self died. Right. So the Bible teaches the death of the old man. So why would we want to dig up the old self? It'd be insane. It would be like the Israelites wanting to go back to Egypt. Right. Okay. And that's warned about in the book of Hebrews. And so that would be apostasy. So the old man is the old self who died. And we come alive in Christ. See, conversion is taking dead sinners and making them alive. Right. Conversion for roar and hurts is excavating the divine essence that's already there, but you just didn't know it. So the, the lost condition, according to these false teachers, is a lack of knowledge that you already have the divine essence, you just don't know it. Wow. In some of these versions of it, God forgot who he was. Oh, no. <laughs> and we got to help remind him. This is what I've read when I've done all this research on these, on emergent and on progressive spirituality and moral and social evolution and panentheism. It's like God lost track of his own being and has to get it back. Wow. Now, that's what we're looking for is this divine essence. I don't know that Roar and Hertz would make that statement, but others of the same panentheistic worldview do. Right. And I wrote about it in my book on emergent. Now, 
We have to know the difference. According to the Bible, we're dead in Adam. We were living for self. We were without Christ, without God in the world, without hope, aliens from the covenants of promise, strangers, and God in his mercy, those who turn to God through Christ, he makes alive and he joins us together in Ephesians 2.15 to be part of the one new man where we actually have the promises of God, we have a future, we have eternal life, and we know that when we die, we go to be with God in heaven. Right. The old self is not somewhere we want to go. No. What's the old self like? Well, Galatians talk about talks about it. What is the flesh about? A outburst of anger, lust, hatred, sorceries. Right. Enmities. That's the that's the flesh. Right. We don't want to excavate that. We want to be dead. Yeah. To that. We are dead to that if we're really Christian. If we go on this excavation process, mining down by solitude, st silence, and stillness, what are we going to find? Well, we mentioned last week, we looked at a video where they're seeing that people that practice these things have all kinds of bad side effects eventually. Right. Paranoia, disconnectedness, rage, anxiety, suicidal thoughts, manic episodes. It may not happen to you. Right. But it has happened. And I've talked to people that's experienced We, we that. both know people who have gone through that. And, and one in particular came to Christ based on what all happened. Yeah. And so you're not excavating the divine essence. You're, go, you're going into a really dark, horrible, scary place that's not good. No. And God gives us a way out. Tell us the way out. Maybe our listeners aren't hearing this in church. What's okay. the way out? It's the come to Christ. And we've already said that Christ preexisted as God and with God. He was born of a virgin. He came into the world. He is truly God and truly man. He lived a sinless life. He predicted his own crucifixion where he would die for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, where he would shed his blood, which he did. He was dead. He was buried. He was in the grave. He bodily was raised from the dead on the third day and conquered death, conquered sin. He appeared to many witnesses to prove that his claims were true. He's the true anointed one, the Christ of God, the Jewish Messiah, the hope of Israel, the salvation of the Gentiles, so he makes the one new man, the church, Ephesians 2.15, he bodily ascended into heaven before witnesses. They saw him, and he promised that there he is at the right hand of God, making intercession for us. He hears our prayers, and he's coming again. Those who trust in him, who repent and believe the gospel, have the hope of eternal life. When we die, we go into his presence. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But if we don't know Christ, we die in a state of alienation and we're lost. And when the final judgment happens, we'll be consigned to hell. Those who know Christ will be with him forever in heaven. There are more details like the new heavens and the new earth. And what we're going to show when we get to this in the next episode is that the self is something that continues to exist. Right. It's not absorbed into the whole. Right. Okay? Because the self either ends up in hell or in heaven, yeah. depending on our relationship to Christ. Listeners, if you're hearing this for the first time, Jesus said, Come unto me, all you are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Believe in Christ, trust in Christ, turn to Christ. He'll take you from darkness to light, from the dominion of Satan to God, and you will know eternal life. Amen. Well, that's a really good way to wrap up this session. For Critical Issues Commentary, this is Jessica Kramus. And Bob DeWay. We'll see you next week. 
We're out of time for this edition of Critical Issues Commentary Radio. We want to remind you that you can access this program at our website at cicministry.org. We want to remind you of Philippians 1.27, Stand firm in one spirit, with one mind, and strive together for the faith of the gospel. 